Well, why don't I get started because I'm just going to uh, set the session up and Chris can keep uh, letting people in while I do that. And uh, so first, uh, so my name is Diane Campbell and it's really my pleasure to welcome you all to this special se uh, session of the symposium on 150 years of weather services in Canada. Uh, first, I would like to ask all the attendees who are joining, please, please mute and turn off your video unless um, you know you are one of the presenters. And I would ask all the attendees, uh, use the chat function if you wanna enter questions or uh, ask for permission to speak. Uh, we, we, we do have a sort of, hopefully we've got a, a pretty full program of questions, but we are gonna try to take uh, some questions from participants if possible near the end. And so just to set us up, this is a special year for us as we celebrate 150 years of serving Canadians. And our celebrations include the contributions from all mm -hmm. the players in the weather enterprise. And that I includes, video, but anyway, I better go. Uh, <laughs> could you, uh, all the contribution, contributions Everybody. from players in, could, uh, could participants Bye. put uh, themselves on mute? Thank you. Um, and today we have a very interesting panel of speakers uh, who share a rather unique honor. They are all recipients of the Order of Canada for their contributions. And the Order of Canada, of course, is one of our country's highest civilian honors. Uh, you know, it was created in 1967, and it recognizes outstanding achievements and dedication to community and service to the nation. And I uh, was quite um, pleased to note when I was looking at Order of Canada recipients that there's been about 15 recipients uh, since the award was initiated uh, that are honored for their contributions to various aspects of weather and, cl and climate enterprise. And I think that's pretty outstanding. And we have five uh, represented today. I would also like to acknowledge um, that, you know, still with us living, we have another couple of Order of Canada winners, uh, Dr. Ray Desjardins, who's an agro-meteorologist, and also the Honorable Liz Dodswell, uh, the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. So as I mentioned before, the way this panel will work, uh, Jim and I are working together. We've prepared some questions for our panelists. Some will ask all the panelists to address in rather a rapid way. Some will direct to one or two of them. And uh, as I said before, hopefully we'll get uh, have some time for some uh, chat with the audience. So with that, Jim, I'm gonna turn it over to you to in briefly introduce our panelists. Thanks very much, Diane. A uh, real pleasure to be with you today. Um, I'm Jim Abraham. Uh, I certainly had a long uh, career with the Meteorological Service of Canada, and three of these uh, uh, esteemed panelists were my boss at the beginning of my career, the middle of my career, and at the end of my career. So it's certainly a pleasure to introduce the esteemed panel. I will start with uh, Jim Bruce. Jim isn't able to join us on the video today. He's certainly listening in. Uh, Jim started his career in the early 1950s, um, newly married to Ruth. Uh, he, was, he started with the Meteorological Service of Canada as an operational forecaster in Moncton and then into Montreal. And then after the disastrous flood with Hurricane Hazel, Jim was assigned as a hydrometeorologist to support the Ontario River Basin Conservation Authorities. And his expertise led to some significant hydrological leadership roles in Environment Canada, as well as the World Meteorological Organization. His leadership also contributed to a number of historical events, like the signing of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and the creation of the Secretariat for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And in 1980, when I was starting my career, Jim became the Assistant Deputy Minister of the Atmospheric Environment Service, which was his return to his original roots with the Meteorological Service of Canada. Next up is David Grimes. Uh, David uh, is currently an adjunct professor at Brock University in St. Cap Catharines, and he's a senior consultant with the World Bank Group. He's been the past president of the World Meteorological Organization until recently and contributed to significant international collaboration over 30 years. And his leadership led to the launch of the Global Framework for Climate Services as well as the Global Cryospheric Watch. David started his career as an operational meteorologist 
I think it was in Halifax, uh, and where I am, and recently retired as the Assistant Deputy Minister of the Meteorological Service of Canada, and he was there for 13 years. Gordon McBain, Professor Emeritus at the Department of Geography and Environment, Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction, and the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Western University. Gordon has led a number of international disaster risk reduction efforts, was the president of the International Council for Science, and he started his career as well as a weather forecaster at Malton Airport. And after completing his PhD, he joined Environment Canada in 1970 as a research scientist studying the atmospheric boundary layer and weather and climate systems. He then went on to become a professor of atmospheric and oceanic, oceanic sciences at University of British Columbia. He was the CMOS president. And then he became the assistant deputy minister for the Atmospheric Environment Service, as I said, which is now the Meteorological Service of Canada. Pierre Morissette began his, his career with the Royal Bank of Canada in 1972. He joined Telemedia Communications as the chief finance officer, and then joined the Canadian Satellite Communications or CANCOM as president and chief executive officer. In 1999, Pierre founded Palmerex, where he is, where he was the president and CEO until recently, and he is now still the executive chairman of the company. Palmerex is the market leader in operating multi-platform television, web, and mobile services in weather-related information. And the leading brands, of course, the Weather Network, Meteo Media, El Tiempo, and Clima. And his company reaches over 55 million users domestically and internationally, with most of the focus in North America, Europe, and Latin America. Palmerex has evolved also by adding market-leading data solutions initiatives. He's uh, been a member of a number of advisory boards related to the IB Business School, as well he's been a member of the board of directors at Rogers Communications. And finally, David Phillips. David has been with Environment Canada's Weather Service for over 50 years. His work activities relate to the study of the climate of Canada and to promote awareness and understanding of meteorology. He has published several books, papers, reports, including a book on the climates of Canada, two bestsellers, The Day Niagara Falls Ran Dry and Blame It on the Weather. And David was the originator of the famous Canadian weather trivia calendar and certainly an important partner with CMOS in that effort. David is probably the best known employee of the Meteorological Service of Canada, frequently appearing on national radio and television as a commentator on weather and climate matters. And again, a frequent friend of CMOS giving lots of talks on behalf of the Meteorological Service. Really a uh, pleasure to welcome you all. And thanks again for your participation. So thank you so much, Jim. So I'm going to start with the first question and uh, you're all going to contribute to this one. We're hoping you'll, you'll give your answer in about five minutes. So the question is, during your long and, and, and very distinguished careers, what notable or game-changing factors or event have contributed to the success of Canada's meteorological enterprise? And Jim, uh, Jim Abraham, you're going to start by just reading some remarks from Jim Bruce. Thank you, Diane, and thank you, Jim. And Jim shared with us a transformative moment and major Canadian event was Hurricane Hazel in 1954, when the tropical storm moved up from the U.S. Atlantic coast and encountered a cold front sweeping in from the west. This event caused severe floods in southern Ontario and drowned over 80 people. The storm itself was well forecast. However, no flood forecastings were available. And in the apt aftermath, a meteorologist through an internal competition was assigned to the secondit to uh, assist with flood warnings and flood prevention 
services with Ontario Conservation Services, I think that must have been Jim. And as a part of this work, the Meteorological Service of Canada assisted with the computation of design floods for floodplain zoning and the limiting of losses. These were calculated by estimating impacts of storms like hazel. I must admit that, uh, you know, working with municipalities, this is indeed a historic uh, accomplishment back in 1954. The, this assignment also became a great innovation for the meteorological service with later assignments with agriculture and forestry, et cetera. And the concept, which was developed by Pat McTaggart Cowan, who's the director of the meteorological service at the time, and led to more active involvement of the meteorological service in environmental and resource management issues. For example, special efforts were made to determine atmospheric transport of contaminants into the Great Lakes. And that was part of studies under the International Joint Commission. As I said, some of that work led to the um, Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Jim has shared some other details that I'm going to respond in another question, but I will say that, you know, when I listen to that water leadership, it's extremely impressive. And what it says to me, and, and I really didn't appreciate the, the amount of demonstrated water leadership in the meteorological service historically, and really it's foundational for the leadership that exists in the weather service within what the government is starting as the Canadian Water Agency. So it really speaks to the, the um, foundation, certainly started by Jim and others on the water side that still exists today. And I'm gonna turn it over now on that question to David Grimes, and uh, that'll be followed by Pierre, Dave Phillips, and Gordon McBain. So David Grimes. Okay, well, thanks, uh, thanks very much. I have a, um, uh, probably a few factors that I think are important. And I'm going to start actually with an international one. Um, I think that it's underestimated the, the value of the leadership of those original 20 directors that came together in 1873 and led to the, the International Meteorological Organization. It was a recognition then that the only way that we would best understand um, the phenomena of weather and its, even its predictability would only be rooted in adopting some common standards and common approaches and free exchange of information amongst its members. That organization grew over the years. Canada was not a member of the first uh, of that first meeting. It was in uh, Vienna, and uh, as my role as president of the World Meteorological Organization, I actually had the uh, the uh, honor, really, of um, having that uh, document shared with me. It was in German, so I have to admit, my good friend Michael from Aus Austria was taking me through that, but it laid out the foundation that we uh, recognize today as having the uh, ability to understand our own weather and our own climate based on having access to, to a world data. And that for me was something that had a very significant impact on Canada. It led to um, a couple of key events um, internationally when it became the World Meteorological Organization. One of those key events related to um, the UN Declaration on Space, and that established the World Weather Watch. And the World Weather Watch led to the global tele telecommunication system, which allowed for the free exchange. And today we have an integrated global observing system. We have a uh, world information system that allows real-time exchange of information. That is a remarkable uh, achievement. And the third point I would raise about the, in the international context is the World Climate Conferences. This was leadership of the WMO, um, of its members, recognizing the importance of bringing politics and science together. 
And that too has made a remarkable difference in, uh, in Canada in a, in a couple of ways. One is, of course, it led to the creation of the IPCC. It also led to the World Climate Program and the World Climate Research Program, which were offsets of that, and the Global Framework for Climate Services, which was sharing of the knowledge and the where, whereabouts that could be used by everyone else. So that's kind of, I think that from a point of view of uh, Canada, that, that having that framework in place and Canada's participation is in a sense the backbone that has made us, you know, uh, as effective as we have been. And I know I have another question coming up on that, and I'll speak a little bit about some key leadership the Canadians provided in that context. I would just highlight two other uh, key points. I think um, the move from Transport Canada to the uh, Department of the Environment was a very significant change for uh, the meteorological enterprise in Canada in, in a couple of ways. One, it provided a recognition that the, the information, the environmental sensing of uh, what we did as part of Transport Canada was critical to this new department that was created you know, 50 years ago. And uh, based on that, I also uh, recognize that many of these major accords that have come up in air quality, such as the Canada-US Air Quality Accord, the Montreal Protocol, you know, um, at, at our national air quality standards was made possible because it was a combination of understanding the atmosphere in combination with understanding the meteorology that sort of brought those elements together. And you know, we've had a rich history in, in Environment Canada, and I think it strengthened us. And the recognition by government that we were critical to this environmental agenda um, actually kind of cemented us in this context of a long, fruitful, and a, and a very prosperous future with regards to that. And the third uh, um, event I would like to highlight had to do with um, uh, and it's related to program review, but not necessarily in the context of how the government had to go through very significant reductions. It was program review helped us uh, help the enterprise kind of reposition itself going forward. It strengthened our focus on establishing critical partnerships. And at that time, you know, the um, uh, NAV Canada was created as kind of a not-for-profit for business corporation that created more discipline with how we interacted with that. It recognized that there were third party like private sector contributors that were gonna be part of those solutions going forward. And it strengthened, I think the resolve that we as an organization needed to um, uh, strengthen our relationships in that broader way. And I think the second aspect related to the government of Canada wanting to do a full review of the um, meteorological service at the time in the context of whether it should be a corporation or not-for-profit or some other form. What that allowed us to do with the Department of Finance and Treasury Board who are really the bankers, right? And the financiers is recognize what the core value the meteorological services were providing to both the economy as well as to the environment and to the safety of citizens. And that never went away because uh, I can tell you my own interaction with the government with the significant modernization of the weather service that started in 2010 was based on those foundation and those principles. The people that were part of the process and understood that were uh, framed there. So anyway, I'll stop there, but thanks very much. Thank you, David. So I'm gonna turn it over to Pierre. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jim. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to uh, express my appreciation for being part of this uh, very distinguished panel. Um, of, um, of meteorological folks 
and um, we, we cover a lot of history and uh, many, many accomplishments along the way, uh, both domestic and internationally. So the answer for me is that from a private perspective, uh, a private market perspective, um, it's been a combination of factors involving customer needs, uh, technology, and science. Um, leadership with vision results in understanding where the market will be, going there, positioning, and creating market leadership, even though you may not yet have a business model for it. So our real-time data led to creating virtual data to fill in geographic voids. That's one breakthrough. Technology has led to adding time dimensions, such as hourly forecasts and 14-day trends. Technology also led to the creation of Canada's emergency alerting system in partnerships involving Canada's federal, provincial, and territorial governments and PELMARPs. These services meet the needs of the public via all available platforms. At first, it was TV services available to all households via the Weather Network and Meteo Media. Then the internet brought us web services. We were early in 1995, and today, the Weather Network and Meteo Media are Canada's largest Canadian website. Along came mobile services. We were early, and today, we are the leading mobile services in Canada. Then along comes data in the form of weather data and user data, and we lead this category of services as well. Our next challenge is to figure out the next growth opportunities based on leveraging market needs, technology, and science. It will evolve, involve evolving from forecasts to predictions. That is, if a certain forecast happens, it means the following insights for customers. So that's been you know, my history of, of uh, the evolution of meteorological services in Canada. Uh, again, based on market needs, based on technology breakthroughs, and based on the evolution of science. Thank you very much, Pierre. Thanks for those contributions. And uh, turn it over to Dave Phillips. Well, Jim and Diane, thank you so much for uh, having me aboard here. I must say I'm in awe of my, my fellow panelists, panelists uh, the I've admired their, their scientific and entrepreneurial uh, skills for, for many years. And, uh, and, and I, I look at these people and I think, my gosh, they've managed budgets of multi-millions of dollars and have supervised hundreds and, and maybe even thousands of supervisors. I've, I've never had a budget. And I've only managed summer students. So, uh, you know, it, it's just a different kind of feel being with these people. But hey, and I've never, I'm gonna answer your question as a historian not for somebody that's even been near the seat of power or any a mover or shaker like, like my fellow panelists. Uh, you know, I'm gonna approach it by looking at a couple of meteorological moments that I think have been transformational or, or really game changers in, in the weather enterprise in, uh, in Canada. You know, back in the 1850s, uh, politicians and scientists were horrified at the loss of life from marine disasters on the Great Lakes and uh, on the high seas. And, and and, and really it was, I think, uh, a near disaster, a near tragedy that, that was very significant. You know, the Great Lakes was considered the most turbulent body of water in the world. And in 1859, there was the steamer, the Plows Boy, that was plying the waters of Lake Huron, heading up to Sault Ste. Marie, and a uh, hundred people aboard as passengers and a few crew. And it was hit by a, by a gale. And it was headed to a rocky shore with sure destruction and loss of life. At the very last moment, the ship's anchor caught hold and it was able to ride out the storm. And it 
obviously a relief to the passengers, including one John A. Macdonald. 12 years later, Prime Minister John A. Macdonald signed the Order in Council establishing the Meteorological Service of Canada and setting up the first storm warning system in North America on the Great Lakes. I can assure you, he, was not, he didn't have to be convinced uh, to do this. In 1930, in July of 1930, the country was excited by a visitor from Great Britain. Think of it, a third of the population of Canada came out in Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto and Niagara Falls to see this visitor. This was not a royal tour. It was the arrival of the R-100 airship, like a dirigible or like the, um, the Hindenburg or, or Zeppelin. And there was a small little office in 315 Bloor Street where a special aviation office was set up. And four young meteorologists worked around the clock to schedule the route of the airship from west of, of Iceland to Canada and back again. And after the airship returned safely, this little special weather and aviation office didn't disband it, it grew dramatically. Because in a short nine years, uh, we established uh, mail air routes uh, across air mail routes across the country. Uh, air uh, Trans Canada Airlines flew the first transcontinental flight. Uh, we saw it became in vogue to go to Europe uh, across the Atlantic in an air an aircraft and uh, and and it was really the explosive uh, period for meteorology in 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 Canada. Uh, the Weather Service went from marine services to uh, air services in a new department called transport. We had 10 professional meteorologists or weather people. We now went to 350 in 10 years. And, and there's a great story about the University of Toronto. The academia trained these young meteorologists for it to be war ready. And I think that's sort of one of the untold stories of the history of meteorology in Canada. The number of weather offices went from four to 68. The budgets went from 200, 000, less than 200,000 to over 2 million, all within nine years. The other moment, I think another moment is important, and Jim Bruce identified it, Hurricane Hazel. My gosh, I mean, they're the father of hydrometeorology that was seconded into the Ontario government, came up with a design storm, which is still in effect today. And that the policy at the service at, the, at, the, at that time was to second meteorologists into, into various um, uh, federal and provincial departments to um, share the the kind of impart knowledge and, and learn directly about user needs and, and issues. And this was the golden era of applied meteorology. And liaisons were established with, with all agriculture, conservation, uh, forestry, uh, 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 building and, and, and building code and engineering. And, and it really went, meteorology went from, from just tracking the weather to adding value to the economic and social sectors of the country. And this was also the beginning of the private consultative weather enterprise in Canada. I mean, if you wanted to be a, an atmospheric scientist or a, a meteorologist, you didn't have to be part of, of government. The next event is the summer of 1988. It was a hot year globally. It was a hot year in Ontario, the second warmest in, in 40 years. And in, in Toronto, six days at the end of June, were above 30 degrees, including a torrid 36. But inside at the Metro Toronto Convention Center was the World Conference on the Changing Atmosphere. And I was 300 politicians and, and NGOs and scientists from 46 countries that came to that seminal conference on climate change. And I was proud to be part of a little secretariat from the Weather Service that for over a year and a half planned, staged, and and successfully completed that, that conference. And, and I think it was a, a time when it was the first conference that ever set carbon emission targets for the world. And also were that, that famous quote about the uncontrollable human experiment with consequences second only to, to global nuclear war. Now, the last kind of moment that I picked was in July of 1996. I remember it well. It was an epiphany for me as I think it was for the weather enterprise in Canada. July 21st, it was a Sunday. I walked from my home to the corner store to get the newspaper. And there it was, the headline, the Saguenay flood, 
our first billion dollar weather related disaster. And two years later came the Eastern Canadian ice storm where today, four million Canadians identify it as the storm of, um, uh, of a lifetime. And then for the next 22 years, a parade of weather disasters. See, this was what missing in Canada. Climate change was about less ice in the North and a warmer decade. But all that the destruction and, and, and weather extremes that were occurring in Bangladesh and Botswana was, was now occurring in Burlington and, and, and Brandon. I mean, this was transformational to the weather enterprise in Canada. I mean, the weather service began to consult more directly with local governments and emergency measures organizations and to ensure communities were better prepared before and, and, and of course, during the severe event. The services became, our service became more impacts uh, related. And not just what the weather will be, but what it, what it will do and what we can do about it. And Canadians for the first time saw weather by looking out their window. It wasn't something they'd have to wait for, it was the here and now. But also important was the acceptance by the insurance sector. They were convinced that meteorological mayhem was mutating. And they went to the uh, uh, board offices in Bay Street or the back rooms in Parliament Hill and they spread the word. They had the numbers to prove it and they became believable and actions took place. And also I think the media even uh, got caught up in this because really uh, now every time there was a garden variety thunderstorm, they thought it came out of our tailpipes and smokestacks. So, so Jim and Diane, those are kind of some of the moments that I think have been transformational to the weather enterprise in Canada. Well, thank you very much, David. Uh, uh, I could listen to your stories all day, of course. <laughs> So Gordon, let's hear from you. Yes, well, it's very hard to follow David Phillips in a way, but I will try and I made some notes as he was going along so I can just chat away to some of those things and just think about, for example, of the huge role that science and technology has played and played an important role in creating not the weather service, but creating the capacity to do the services the weather organizations do. Um, I sometimes tell the story how back in 1957, when I wasn't very old, but I was older than you guys, uh, uh, I stood with my parents on the front porch of our house and watched this little dot go through the sky. It was Sputnik. And little did I realize at that time that that technology, the science that led to an ability to put something in space would lead to the science and technology it would enable us to see the atmosphere, the planet. It was also, I didn't realize at that time, of course, that that was part of what was called the International Geophysical Year, which was sponsored by the International Council for Science, never imagining that I would later be involved in huge programs with it and those kind of things. So there's been this role of science and technology in creating the opportunity. If we go back, as David talked about the creation of the Weather Service in 1871. Uh, the fact that the US had had a weather service earlier and there was science and technology that said this weather stuff didn't just happen randomly. It happens in a, in a way in which there is some possibility of predicting what will happen the next day or so. Uh, at the same time, there was the technology of something so fundamental as the telegraph or teletype, whatever it was called in those days that allowed you to convey the information back and forth between where it is observed to where it is needed and to the people who need to know the information. And those things of the science and technology came together. And as David and well, Jim Bruce's comments and others have spoken about, there is what I learned in my time as an academic, I'm appointed a professor of political science, which I've never had a course in in my life. And I slowly learned some of the terminology they use. And the one that's really important is focusing events. The focusing events that created the storms as you talked about on the Great Lakes in the, in the 1868, nine period for which some US people were able to avoid because they had a warning, don't go out there today, but there was no Canadian weather service. So the focusing event is what basically causes people to take action. It's the focusing event of, of other kinds of events. Hurricane Hazel is an obvious example and many others, <clears throat> the Saguenay flood, the now more recently, oh, we just had a year ago, next week, the uh, 
Calgary hailstorm, $1.2 billion in insured losses from one hail event. Uh, it's amazing the costs and these things. Fortunately, in that case, there was no one uh, killed. But the Montreal ice storm, there were many deaths, but there was even tragically the impact on people's mental health oh, in ways no. that caused long-term impacts. And I think these are the kind of things that we in the weather service field really play a huge role in of understanding the way in which tragic events like fires and hailstorms and ice storms and flooding have impacts on our society in ways that really overwhelm us. And that's why we need to, as we have done in through projects and programs, uh, bring things together. There's a need to have more integration across these issues. Uh, I think the, well, I joined uh, Environment Canada Actually, I joined the Meteorological Service of Transport Canada as a weather forecaster. Just so you know, I planned this so carefully that I went into an office in 1964 for what I thought was a summer job. And I already had a master's degree accepted to do a master's degree in superconductivity, low temperature physics. And these two guys were from the Met office. I didn't even know what meteorology stood for, but they explained to me and said, we can send you McGill U of T, your choice, do a master's degree and then be a weather forecaster. And I thought this sounded quite interesting, except as a Canadian born and raised in Vancouver, I hated Toronto in those days. So the only choice was McGill, Montreal. <laughs> so anyway, the long and the short of it is things start in certain ways, but it has been to me the fascinating, interesting, complex, but nonetheless a very important science that we do to understand our weather and more recently, in the last few decades, our climate system, air pollution issues, other kinds of things, and their relationship with society that I think is so important. And it's been evolving, as we say, the, the success of the meteorological enterprise is in part because of the impacts of weather and climate. And Pierre knows about this in terms of people look on, they check their forecast, they check the weather site. Uh, Environment Canada is the weather networks, the various sites to see, well, what is it going to be like today, tomorrow, the next day? Um, it's, uh, well, anyway, it's a very important thing. I think it's very important that we go back and look at some of the things. 1988, as you mentioned, was that famous conference. But for me, it was a very important year because, uh, among other things, it was the year that Jim Bruce played the role, as it was commented, in leading, creating the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I was part of that process because around that, at that time, I had been made the chair, the first non, first Canadian to be chair of the World Climate Research Program's International Scientific Committee. And just jokingly, I can say that after the Russian and Chinese members of the committee buttered me up and told me how wonderful I was, they said, of course, after I said, yes, I'm willing to have you guys nominate me to be the next chair, I was very pleased. I replaced Sir John Mason, but I didn't get a Sir title as a result of it. Uh, but the uh, point was that uh, they said, your biggest advantage, Gordon, is you're not an American or Brit, but you do speak English and you're a nice guy. And I think we can play roles as Canadians of, of playing that role, David Grimes and um, well, just by chance, the World Climate Research Program is co-sponsored by WMO. And at one point, a few years ago, we had the Canadian president of WMO, the International Council for Science with a Canadian president, me, and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission with Wendy Watson Wright as being the assist as the head of UNESCO's Oceanographic Commission. So we had three Canadians chairing each of the organizations that sponsored the major global research program on climate change. So these things have been very important, the science and policy. Um, I think uh, we went through tough times, but at the same time as David Grimes talked about learning times in the, the 1990s, but we sat down with people like Pierre Morissette and others to come to agreements as to how the public sector, private sectors could work most effectively together in order to deliver weather services to all Canadians. And we need to see how we can, let's say, enhance that. And I'll talk about that more later, but. I think we've run out of time for this session, so I'll stop now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Gordon. Well, thank, thank you all. I mean, that, that was, I don't think we could have scripted that better uh, in terms of covering the ground of important events that changed uh, how people viewed 
the importance of weather services through the need to focus in on uh, understanding what users needed and give them that to the pivotal role of science and being able to evolve our, our services over time and to fundamentally the importance of international collaboration in a profound way in order to advance uh, uh, both in Canada and globally. So thank you so much. And there's a segue into the next question. So we're gonna pick up on that international theme. And so the next question is how has Canada contributed to the global weather enterprise and how have we benefited from that? And so Jim, uh, we'll turn it over to you. You're gonna start by reading uh, Jim Bruce's piece on this and then turning it to the others. Thank you, thank you much, uh, Diane. And no surprise, um, uh, Jim's name was mentioned a couple of times already related to climate change. And he shared in fact that in 1985, climate change was appearing on the horizon as an important global issue. The Meteorological Service of Canada established the Canadian Climate Program Board under the initial chairmanship from Professor Ken Hare. And MSC played a prominent role in the VILIC 1985 conference on climate change. And that was named the week that the climate changed by the New Scientist magazine. And that subsequently led to the establishment of the IPC IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. <clears throat> Another noteworthy initiative was the Toronto International Conference on Climate Change. And it was in that hot summer of 1986. That was chaired by Howard Ferguson, who had just taken the position as the, uh, the uh, director of the Meteorological Service. And that conference made the first calls for carbon emission reduction, and it involved Prime Minister Mulroney and Stephen Lewis. The uh, staff from Meteorological Service of Canada were involved in the IPCC right from the inaugural meeting in Geneva in 1987. And 20 years later, the IPCC received the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo. And along with Al Gore from the United States, Jim Bruce was honored to be the Canadian invited to attend that ceremony. Also while playing a major role in environmental issues like acid rain and climate change, a well-organized, a well-oiled uh, Meteorological Service of Canada machine continued to provide the highest quality forecasts and climate data to Canadian citizens. And the climate change issue moved more and more to an active role in countries. A drafting committee was established to produce an emission control convention in time for the Rio Earth Summit 1992. I remember that I was working for Elizabeth Doswell at the time. She was the uh, Assistant Deputy Minister of the Meteorological Service of Canada, and she was an active participant in drafting the International Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992. So thank you, Jim, for those um, significant uh, international contributions uh, and significant international leadership uh, from the Meteorological Service of Canada on the climate file. I'll turn this over to David Grimes now. You're on mute, David. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. I just want to pick up on, uh, on Jim's uh, point because, um, you know, when the, uh, it's been clear that Canada has made very significant contributions to uh, the international community in numerous ways. And one, one uh, aspect, and we've talked a little bit by the IPCC, and, um, and I believe it was these, during the second assessment report, uh, Jim Bruce, and this was uh, my second encounter with Jim. I, I had uh, come to uh, Ottawa and, in the uh, uh, by 1984 or something, and he was assistant deputy minister, and he was a very good person for mentoring um, people and their leadership, and very thoughtful and warm individual. 
And that reflected his capacity to bring people together internationally. So I supported the third working group of IPCC to which Jim was the chair. And his interest is the first time that in, in the second that they had set up this kind of integrated, um, it's kind of an integrated assessment looking at the economics of climate change. And in some respects, that particular report was stressing the importance of acting now versus acting later. And Howard Stern, of course, produced, and no, Howard Stern, um, um, the, uh, he was the, uh, um, the chief economist of the UK. And, and he, he produced, the this this report on the impacts of uh, the downstream impacts and the costs associated with adaptation versus taking early action on uh, on climate change and the cost of mitigation in that report was less. This was a key theme that was kind of brought out during that uh, second uh, second assessment report to which Jim provided the leadership for that in bringing community together. And I have, have to say, I was in, um, a, in awe because it was a very difficult topic, if you can imagine. You're, you, you've got everyone that's looking to sort of drive um, the uh, economic agenda forward in more traditional ways, while at the same time recognizing that the uh, cost of intervention now would be a lot less than the cost of intervention later. And so I think that was a key point. And uh, uh, Jim's leadership was outstanding in that, uh, in that capacity. I think the second, um, the second point I would um, mention is the international polar year. So Gordon already spoke about the geophysical year, but in 2007, there was, um, under the leadership of the World Meteorological Organization, uh, supported primarily by Russia and Canada at the beginning, to establish another um, uh, a focus on understanding change in the polar regions, driven by climate, mostly, but trying to understand in what I call the full kind of Earth system perspective, both from the ideas of food chain to to uh, broad scale changes. And um, there was some significant Canadian leadership on that. And um, part of that was um, uh, uh, Belin, who was the, at that time, was the president of the Commission for Atmospheric Research. And there was Barry Goodison, who, as we all know, was probably one of the world's leading cryo cryosphere scientists in that recognition. And the importance, and we, we initiated an action in 2003 under his leadership and under the leadership of Jeff Key in the United States who were looking at you know, the cryosphere and the significant changes in the cryosphere and how this was poorly represented in, in, the, con in the context of the discussions related to uh, both um, water security and in the context of climate. In fact, the cryosphere was underestimated. I, I had the privilege of being at the Paris, um, at Paris during those negotiations as part of the UN delegation. And you know, the cryosphere science was not as well understood, which gave reason for why this kind of discussion came up with the one and a half degrees. But the work in the IPY by Canada in pushing forward on the importance of recognizing that the cryosphere in the polar regions in particular needed very special attention and that these were gonna have very significant change uh, forcing, forcing changes on the, on the climate, on the food sources and the marine biota and also in biodiversity in um, in the northern region. So for me, that that aspect of IPY and standing up and the Canadians that step forward to sort of move that forward 
is, is a clear example. Um, my third example is the uh, Global Framework for Climate Services. Um, I would say it was Canadians that moved that agenda forward. It was very, very thorny. It was all about money. And we, uh, the Canadians that were part of that delegation, helped refocus the debate from being on money to being on science and serving the people, particularly the vulnerable nations of the world. And we secured agreement for, for that um, a couple of years after the third um, summit on, um, on uh, World Climate uh, Conference. So with that, we, we, you, could, you could look at, we were instrumental in hydrology, moving the commission on hydrology for the Canadians pushed for that. We had strong leadership through um, on our developing the first commission on climatology, one of the oldest commissions in WMO up until recently. And so I, I feel that um, the Canadians brought a very strong focus on the science agenda that WMO needed to embrace. And Gordon already talked about his leadership role in the World Climate Research Program. And really it was at the formative years and positioned well and still positioned well today. So with that, I'll conclude. Thanks, David. And so let's move on to Gordon and give some th your thoughts on uh, the global weather enterprise and uh, Canada's leadership. Okay, well, thanks to uh, David and, and Jim and for uh, both Jims. Um, just let me say that I think uh, we have played a, a role and I and now it's kind of ad-libbing since I'm trying to fit these things in with other things. But let me just say that one of the things that's been important is Canada's being Canada as opposed to some of the other major developed countries that we have a relationship that we can work with more actively and proactively with developing countries. Uh, the role we can play, for example, uh, since we're talking about uh, climate change, for example, uh, the, the Canadian International Development Assistance Agency for many years supported these things. And then well, from 2010 to 2015, I had a funded project from the International Development Research Center of Canada to look, work together with communities in Africa and Asia on coastal cities at risk due to climate change. We had a research projects with people in Manila and Bangkok and Lagos, Nigeria and others to work together as a team. And I think that the role we could play, I felt many times as a Canadian, could be seen as being more positive, less possibly conflicting with some other, let's say larger, we speak English, one's French, un peu, pour moi. Uh, but nonetheless, we can play a role in working together with them more in partnership in a positive way that will lead to proactive results and development of things in these other countries, and also giving the benefits to Canada in the sense that we better understand the way in which these systems, you work as a team studying coastal storms and sea level rise and, and, and approaches as we did across disciplines. I actually had economists and social scientists and engineers as part of my research team with our usual natural sciences groups of people and as they did in the other countries. And this was very important. Uh, some of the issues of equity and those kind of things. And I think Canada's leadership role in dealing with social and societal issues has gone up and down over the decades of my time, but generally speaking, it's been positive, well-recognized and supported by Canadians to make a difference for the benefit of all. And that's what we try and do with our science for the benefit of all within Canada and working together in partnerships with those around the world. And that's the way we've contributed. And I think we have benefited as well as hopefully, and I think directly you can say the global societies have benefited from this. So I'll stop there, thank you. Well, thanks very much, Gordon. So I'm gonna to turn to the other two panelists, uh, Pierre Martinset and David Phillips with another question. And the question is, how has the role of the private sector, and in particular, the media changed over the past 150 years in providing weather services to Canadians? And how do you see it changing over the next decade or so? 
So I'll start with David uh, Phillips. You're David, you muted yourself. Uh, well, I, I'm a big fan of the media and uh, uh, not as a few of my colleagues who uh, see it as a nuisance or, or to, be, to be ignored at times, I think. I think on the contrary, our media partners have been crucial to the success of the weather enterprise and, and really vital to our role in delivering weather words to Canadians over the ages. If I could be permitted a, another historical moment. Back in 1876, um, three months after the very first forecast was posted outside of the railway station and post office, every newspaper in Eastern Canada carried the forecast. Not that the editors wanted to, they hated it. They thought it was a fad. They thought it was fake news, the, the weather forecast. But they wouldn't dare not put it in because people bought newspapers because of the weather forecast. And so I think that availability of weather forecasts in daily newspapers became an accepted, almost a, an integral part of, of Canadian life just as in the 1920s and 30s with radio. I mean, radio segment following the news segment has just been established and it's been going uh, for, for well over uh, a century. And then of course, uh, that famous uh, moment in 1952, those famous words that were uttered, uh, and now here's the weather, spoken by Percy Saltzman, that chalk throwing meteorologist who for 22 years gave the weather on Canadian uh, television. And he was the first face, imagine, how fitting is that? The first face on Canadian television was Percy Saltzman, a couple of puppets and then Percy. And, and then of course, Rube Hornstein, my gosh, he was educating and entertaining Canadians with his weather wisdom and weather knowledge for, for a long period of time. You know, I think we were so lucky in this country that our first early weather presenters uh, in, in the, and the, in the media were meteorologists and scientists. Not like in the United States. I mean, they thought presenting weather was boring. And so what you found were, or they were puppets and pets and, and clowns or, or young smiling faces presented the weather. I mean, we took sort of the, the high road in this, uh, this country. I think at times the media has been critical of the weather service, for sure, the weather enterprise. I think they've embarrassed us at times and, and they've kept us on our toes. I mean, they pushed uh, us hard to deliver weather services before we wanted to deliver them. I mean, the impetus for the three-day, five-day, seven-day forecast came from the, the media. I mean, probability of precipitation. I know some meteorologists today that hate that, but it's been going for 40 years because of the insistence of the, uh, of, of, of the media. And in terms of long-range weather forecasting, my gosh, we'd still be sitting on that if it wasn't for the media. But by forcing us to get it out and taking ownerships and defending it, I think it's improved the science. It's, it's forced us to get better at it and, and to identify users and, and uses for it. So I think Canadians are better educated and more informed about the weather and safer than ever before. And I think a large part of that is because of the, the work that the media has done over the ages. Now, Jim, you asked about the decade. I'm, I'm more of a historian than a futurist, but. Hey, I, I would say that what I see in the next 10 years is, is maybe a little bit more climate change information being introduced to weather segments. You know, one of the great changes we've seen in recent years is the acceptance by weather broadcasters for climate change. I mean, they were one of the first deniers, but now there's a vast majority of them who, who believe in the fact that this is the threat that it really is. I think I would hope that we have maybe closer association with the media and CMOS. I think the accreditation program is good. I think we should look for maybe training or certificates, or I think there's more that we could do with CMOS and, uh, and with the, the media. But I think one thing that a solution we've tried for 150 years won't, won't ever be achieved. And that is seeking, meteorologists seeking respect. You know, I think bloggers, reporters, editors, the lay people will always complain that forecasts have barely improved over the years. And I think we should continue to grow our skin thick because I don't see a change too bad at all. 
And I think there's a, a simple explanation for it. I think our skill scores have gone up marginally so, but what has gone up faster are the expectations of weather and from weather forecasts by Canadians. And sometimes our success is our worst enemy. I mean, you get it right once and they think you can deliver all the time. So I think that's a hardship that we have to face. And so I think helpfully the media that can help us explain risk and uncertainty and, and some of the other scientific issues that, that meteorologists face in getting the word out. Thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, Pierre, are you a fan of media? <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Um, I'll, I'll just um, tell a bit of a story. It's. Uh, Around 1999, Toronto has a huge storm, massive storm, and the mayor of Toronto calls in the army to clear the streets. And that coincided with, fortuitously for us, with the launch of our billboard campaign in the GTA, big yellow billboard, with an arrow pointing to the sky saying, told you so. And that made our billboard campaigns more successful than ever. And they had pictures of it on the front page of the Toronto Star, a picture of our billboard that said, told you so. So that, that's, um, people still talk about that. It, it's uh, just had a, a really fond memory in, uh, in, in people's minds. Um, media's role is to communicate to and inform the public via the platforms in place and to develop new platforms. Government's role, amongst many other things, is to provide infrastructure in the form of real-time data, radar, and satellites. It is also to be the source of alerting messages while the private sector delivers those messages to the public in the target area. Also, government is responsible for research in climatology, the environment, and basic weather. Since weather is international, that is, it originates in one part of the world and moves to a different continent, government is the coordinating body with other countries. So media players such as the Weather Network and Meteo Media must continue to evolve based on market shifts and market needs. In the next decade, we're adding a climate change category to explain the best practices by consumers, business, and government to win the climate change battle. We're also moving into the predictions market. And that is, if you have a certain forecast, it means that certain events will result. So that's, that's how, you know, basically we see the, the evolution. Um, I think our, our science and technology will continue to evolve, yielding more, more accurate forecasts, uh, maybe for longer periods, but still past seven days, it is a trend. And it'll probably be a trend for quite a while, but maybe a more reliable trend. And that's, uh, and the, our job is still to inform, communicate, make the public aware to satisfy their needs that cover where do, uh, how do I travel to work today? What do I plan for the weekend? How do I plan my next vacation? And things mm -hmm. along those lines. And that's, um, that's how I see it. Thanks very much, Pierre. And uh, thanks for sharing where the media fits into the whole weather enterprise. That was great. I'll turn it over to Diane for the- Yeah, thank question. you. Thank you. So that, this is a good segue into the next question. And again, we're, we're looking forward now and we're asking in 50 years, where will this rapidly evolving advancements in science and technology take us? And so I'm gonna start over to you, Gordon, and then uh, turn to David and Pierre. Well, thank you, Diane. I, first of all, I just wanted to point to this thing behind me. If you look up there on the screen, 
what you see is a license plate that says weather on it. This was given to me by the smiling face Jim Abraham when I left the government in the year 2000 to thank me for his my contributions to weather. Uh, if you, I can't take us outside now because we're not allowed to do it quite that way and show you the license plate on my own car. And it says G-L-B-L-C-H-N-G. And according to my grandchildren, that stands for global change. And I think what we want to see is evolving even more so over the decades to come is the evolution from importantly continuing to deal with weather, but to integrate that with the other elements of our system, our floods, our environmental change, but also other aspects to do with the way things are evolving so we can have a more integrated environmental prediction. Uh, it was one thing I actually, back in the 90s when I was ADM, I pushed the idea at meetings of the Envi Environment Canada Management Board. And one of the other ADMs actually told me when I was leaving, he said, Gordon, you know, your most positive contribution to this department was to get us thinking about integrated total environmental prediction. I'm not sure they actually wanted to do it, but uh, they at least were talk interested in the idea where we could actually say, as I like to say, we set up a system that informs and where appropriately warns Canadians about the changing events of weather, hail, et cetera, but also floods and heat that affects your health, relating to health messages, air pollution, those kind of things in a way we can inform people of the kind of actions, not only for the next few days, next week, the next season, but actually literally decades away so that we can have actions. For example, uh, years ago, we had debate on the Environmental Management Board about the issue of uh, species at risk. And the whole philosophy, as I saw it, was focused on protecting a particular ecosystem. And I kept saying, well, what about when the climate changes? That ecosystem may no longer be habitable in a sense by the animals that are there and they're going to migrate somewhere else. I think you need to factor those things in. There was a reluctance to do that then, but I think we need to work in a way that we are this, uh, by doing this more integrated total environmental prediction approach. And over the next 50 years, I hope we'll have the science and technology, the observing system so that we go beyond the, let's say physical chemical nature of the atmosphere, ocean, biosphere system, but more in including biological information in a way that we can integrate environmental prediction and see how that will change the biosphere as well as the, the where humans uh, and us work and seeing so that we go from the weather service. And so when the next, the ADM, I have to admit, Diana, we have a few after you, but the ADM who retires a few years from now gets a license plate, which I'll save one of mine called global change. So I think we can work in that way and do things in a more integrated way. Um, and I think the technology is there. There is a need for, let's say, bringing in the policy and the societal recognition and quite frankly, the governance issue. The biggest governance issues in Canada are is, well, I'll just say anecdotally, when I talked about putting out air pollution forecasts in the greater Toronto area in the 1999 period, because the minister wanted it, my provincial counterpart told me if we dare mention air pollution in the forecast, we'd be taken to the Supreme Court. That's a provincial responsibility. We're not allowed to talk about it. Similarly with flooding now. I just finished an earlier meeting today where we were talking about this issue of floods crossing boundaries and how do we deal with these things. And hopefully we can work both politically and scientifically in order to make us able to more integrate and be seen as a science-based policy relevant, but not directed by policy response strategy. So thank you very much. I'll stop there to give us some time to hear from all the rest of you who've got good things to say. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, so I'll turn to you, Pierre. You're on mute, Pierre. Thank you for reminding me. Um, the big trends are AI, artificial intelligence, and uh, computing power. 
Um, there are other peripheral trends such as robotics and self-driving and all those things. But in, in our field, it's, it's AI and, and computing power. And consumers will have a need to know the very short-term forecasts and the longer term trends to plan their needs. Data improvements because of AI and computing power will enable these to continuously get better. We're also focused on going deep in a market and becoming the leader in that market. Today we lead in Canada and in Spain from a media perspective. And we are emerging, emerging as a leader in South America by our Clima brand. So we're serving about uh, 50 to 60 million users now. In Canada, we serve over 30 million users because they use multiple platforms. So that, that's, that's our strategy. Um, versus having one brand going across the world, skimming the top 10%, we pick a country and we go deep in that country. So we have Canada, we have Spain. As a multi-generational family enterprise, we will continue to add markets and to enhance our product line of products and services. Our next target, will probably be 75 million users and will then become 100 million users. And we have a long-term forecast to back that up. So we'll continue to grow from our current third place in the world to higher. How high that may be, uh, sky's the limit, but we'll, we'll see over time. The thing about exporting your technology, your know-how, your infrastructure into another market, you're exporting that. It's good for Canada. But you're also exporting your values. You're exporting your way of doing things. And quite frankly, my experience has been that a whole bunch of countries out there have a lot to learn from us Canadians because we do things quite well. So that's, that's what I see over time is just a continued evolution uh, in our business. We're adding climate to it. We've been doing that for a couple of years now in more depth. And uh, the two of weather and climate are, are interrelated and will continue to grow one country at a time. Thank you, Pierre. So Jim's going to give the next question. Of course, I'm on mute. Um, so the next question is for Dave Phillips. And Canadians, and Pierre just said it, Canadians love their weather. And there's just an enormous growth in that passion and interest in the weather. So what is it, David, that really, what is the mystique around weather here in Canada? And are my grandchildren and great-grandchildren going to feel the same way in 50 years from now? So what are your thoughts on that? Well, Jim, you know, I, I think you're right. I mean, I, Canadians have always been interested and obsessed with the weather. I mean, I think even today we're more interested in the weather than there are forefathers and foremothers. I mean, my gosh, uh, they were much more fatalistic about the weather than we are. And, and I think we just, as Canadians, we love it, we hate it. Uh, not because we talk about it more than any other subject, uh, but I think it's because it's important to us, our lives and our livelihood. It's always been that way. And, and I think always will be. So your great grandchildren will, will also be uh, weather weenies and, and talking about it like we are today. I think part of the appeal of weather is that it's real. It's not artificial or, or abstract. I, I think no other subject for me uh, is, compares to the pervasiveness of weather. And I can't think 
of a field of science other than meteorology that the average Canadian understands better and therefore uses its information so effectively in a whole host of daily activities. You know, if Canadians thought meteorology was or weather was science, they'd feel intimidated. They don't think it's that. They think it's lifestyle. I mean, you wouldn't start your day out without consulting the, uh, uh, the weather. And I think that for me, and I've heard every one of these panelists utter this, for me in a country where it's hard to bring Canadians together, it's our need to know the weather is, is homogeneous. I mean, 94% of Canadians consult a weather forecast every day to plan their activities. Uh, it leaves me wondering what the other 6% do, but hey, that's, that's uh, for us, I guess, to, to discover. But I have a hope for the future though. Um, hopefully our forecasts will never be 100% correct and our timing will never be perfect because I think that would take the fun out of being Canadian. I think we all love to guess what the weather's going to be. And if mother nature, if we knew what it was going to be, I, I think we'd have, what else would we talk about if we, uh, if we always knew the forecast was going to be totally accurate. So, hey, those are my thoughts on the, this mystique of Canadians and their love-hate relationship with the weather. Thank you, David. As a weather weenie, a joint weather weenie, I completely agree with you. <laughs> Thank you for that, Dave. So we're in the final question and we're gonna handle this one a little bit differently. Uh, we're gonna to turn to all of you and we're gonna use a rapid fire format. So you're gonna get one minute. Um, and in 60, so in 60 seconds or less, what are you going to identify as the major challenge or opportunity facing the weather enterprise over the next 50 years? So Gordon, I'm gonna to turn to you first. Well, thank you. Um, I think first of all, we want to do is build upon the opportunities and things that people like Jim Bruce, my famous friend and mentor who's here watching us now, uh, did. How these people, how we brought things together. And I think we need to look upon the next 50 years as an opportunity to go, as I talked about in my last comments, bring together that total environmental prediction so that we overcome the science and technology obstacles, which I think are possible, but also address the political societal things so that we have not only people talking about the weather, but they talk about climate change. They, as they understand how the climate is affecting things, we can bring that in and factor in the other aspects of the environment that we can, quite frankly, literally bring together in terms of prediction systems to, so that all of our societies are better off. So thank you. Thank you. So Dave, you next. Well, I think our mission is what is, it was now as it was 150 years ago, the safety and security of Canadians. I mean, such a simple and compelling and, and crucial mission. I mean, stay with what brought you here. I, I think that's something that, uh, that is, is in our lifeblood and, and will continue to be so. But you know, I think the strength of the weather enterprise as I see it over the last 150 years has been the people, the people of the weather enterprise in Canada and always has been. And I think that that will continue to be. I mean, it's, our, I think, our most important resource. I think we've been blessed in the weather, in the meteorological uh, service and in, in meteorological enterprise uh, with people who are enthusiastic and dedicated and talented and diverse uh, over all these years. I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence that the biggest employers of weather professionals in Canada, the Weather Network and Meteorological Service of Canada, their employees have ranked their organizations as the top rated employees, employer in the last uh, uh, several years. I think that's probably because we treat our, our people fairly, but also I think it's that sense of purpose is very clear. It's whether you're in, you're in academia or the private sector or media or the government, I think there's great satisfaction in what we do and how well we do it matters to every Canadian from coast to coast to coast. And in my case, I think it's the best example of public service that exists. There is, I think there's no better example of why government exists and, and why it sometimes works. So I think it's the people are, crucial, always have been, 
and going ahead, I think always will be. Great answer, David. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Pierre. Um, yes. Um, well, from a private enterprise perspective, uh, you know, just the power of weather. You know, we we've emerged as as one of the leading brands in Canada, one of the most influential and trusted brands. The word trust is is just so uh, important. Um, so I just want to put that out there. But um, I, I agree with David. Really, it's it comes down to people, and whether it's in private enterprise or even in government, entrepreneurial people with vision and the ability to execute are both the challenge and the opportunity. The challenge in finding them, and then once you do find them, then letting them go. That's uh, weather and climate change are growth categories, but the revenue streams evolve over time. So the key to success is to constantly reinvent your business while sticking to your core. So this requires entrepreneurial people with vision and the ability to execute. Thank you so much, Pierre. So David, we're going to leave the last word to you and then potentially okay. take a question from the chat. Okay. So, um, I would say that the a challenge and opportunity is going to be um, the coordination or the interaction with all the new players that are going to enter the space over 50 years. Um, I see that with uh, the trends towards uh, reaching sort of a zero net emissions, you see it in industry now, many industries have come forward you're seeing governments making these proclamations. This is only going to happen when you re-engineer society, not just people and their behavior, but also economic systems. And this is a uh, space for uh, what I see the private sector playing a much stronger role. And therefore, you know, it's a question of understanding about how these roles will evolve over time. What will be the role of the public good service in this particular context of climate risk communication. And I think the last uh, significant challenge uh, for all players is gonna be affordability. We're reaching a stage now where even on satellites, they have to do post-processing of information in order to share data. They can't share raw data anymore. It's, it's too, too expensive, too, to, um, uh, uh, like the bandwidth required to be able to bring down those volumes is significant. This will apply to ex, uh, exascale computing and higher resolution models and how we manage this data, data architecture, which Pierre rightly points out as being critical in order to enable these kinds of changes is gonna be an issue that, a challenge that both government and private sector have to work together in order to, and even the academic sector, looking at better technologies to uh, do that. To me, this will be the challenge in the future. Thanks. Thank you, David. And I have to say such a wonderful thank you to all of the panelists. This was a very rich discussion. So Jim, I think we're gonna to try to take one question before we wrap up. Uh... Sure. So first of all, I'll share a comment that uh, Bob Jones shared. He's the archivist for um, CMOS. And there's been a lot of great stories about great people in this discussion. And a lot of the people are featured in the archives of CMOS. Just enter a name, enter your own name. Your picture may show up. And, uh, and, and so CMOS has a wonderful archive that's actually part of the 150 years that we've been talking about. So I'd encourage that. Uh, Harinder uh, um, Alawalia has asked a question. He's uh, been playing a leadership role in the International Federation of Meteorological Societies. And they've recently brought together 
um, the African nations for uh, and developed an African meteorological society. And he's, he indicated that Canada had set aside um, be, around 2015, $2.4 billion for climate change support for developing and least developed countries. And I'll direct this first to David Grimes because David may know something about this. Harinder's wondering whether or not some of that money should go to national meteorological societies, especially the society. So CMOS is a, a, a national meteorological society, but in the least developing countries and the developed countries, a mechanism for those countries to work together uh, from a societal professional kind of point of view. Just wondering if you'd like to uh, make a comment on that, David. Sure, uh, just briefly, uh, when the government announced that 2.4 billion, um, it was very much focused on um, adaptation initiatives in sort of being able to build capabilities in countries. And it had uh, targets towards um, sort of uh, building um, protective infrastructure, for instance, or building more resilient infrastructure. It also went into supporting better uh, provision of climate services and better access to knowledge. And so in that regard, you know, money went to the South Pacific and the Caribbean and Haiti and a bunch of other places that with that in mind. So it's not really been targeted for that particular purpose. My experience, at least when I was in government is that there are very specific requirements that usually are attached to these, these financial initiatives. Thank you, David. Uh, Gordon or any others have any perspective on that? Oops, a quick comment to say that uh, I don't know anything about the details of the government anymore. I lost track of all of that, but I was the president of the International Council for Science. And as I should have bragged about earlier, we merged the International Council for Science with the International Social Science Council. Uh, to bring together all of these disciplinary issues in a more integrated way so we could have, as we said, global science for a common public good of benefits for all. But importantly, there is a hundred and I think it's 140 or so international academies that are members of this. And I'd have to say is that although I was the president for four years and president elect for three before that, uh, Canada's role was not very obvious. <laughs> And I would encourage us to work through existing international organizations and working with Arinda's organizations to see how we can bring the scientific communities together to better work together uh, more positively across countries, across disciplines, and those kind of things for these kind of benefits. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gordon. So, Jim, I think it's time to wrap up. Great. Uh, can I start? I'll leave. You it. can start. Yeah. Perfect. So I, I just made a couple of notes because um, this was amazing, uh, very inspiring. Um, and some of the words that struck me um, leadership with vision, I think, really speaks a lot to what all five of you have shared and have delivered really to us and to Canadians meteorological moments and focusing events and stories is certainly an important part of certainly what I do every day. Um, and what's really came out as well is the important role uh, that meter the Meteorological Service of Canada plays within Environment Canada. So it's leadership role on the environmental issues, on water issues, on climate issues and the relationship with society and the trust in the work that we do. As much as David Phil Dave Phillips says, you know, there's a lot of whining and complaining goes on and everybody at the golf course says, Jim, why do you tell people you're a meteorologist? Uh, I love telling people I'm a meteorologist. <laughs> um, and, and climate change was really in global change. Uh, you know, the license plate, uh, Gordon's, other license plate, global change, was an important part of the conversation. And when you think about us here at the Congress, the theme is climate change. 
And the passion that I've heard in the first four days and the leadership and the storytelling is really what's been taking place here at CMOS. So my prediction, not in the next 50 years, my prediction in the next 10 to 20 years, and, and Pierre talked about the people that we need, the people we need in our business, a lot of them are the people that have come to this session and to CMOS. And my prediction in 10 to 20 years is that some of them will be sitting on a panel and some of them will be awarded the Order of Canada in the next couple of decades. So I'd like to congratulate you for the stories that you've shared and the passion you've shared. And I look forward to the next 10 or 20 years for the next panel, maybe here in Halifax, I'll host it. <laughs> Thank you. So I don't think I dare uh, try to top a prediction by uh, Jim Abraham. That was a great summary. And the only thing I would add uh, that I heard was really the importance of international engagement and leadership and how important that is for Canada and how important it will be for Canada going forward. And just uh, to wrap up, I'd like to also add my thank yous to Jim's. Uh, you've been wonderful panelists, thoughtful. I, I, I won't forget it. And I really appreciated the opportunity to hear from all of you. And on a final note, uh, with Jim and his role at CMOS and my role, we really do feel that it's incredibly important to have a strong society in Canada uh, with membership from all of the various partners. And we're going to work together to make sure that we keep that going. So with that, I'd like to thank you all. Um, thanks for all of your insights and wisdom and sharing your challenges and opportunities. Uh, and thank you to the participants for joining us for this session.